Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. There's a quick little change going on. I went and I looked at how the uh, camcorder they set, and set up in the back was working. Wasn't super happy about its quality. It was impossible to see some of the slides. I wasn't super easy to hear. So I'm hoping some of my uh, own equipment will make things a little bit better. And as we so often begin at the start of class, let's get into Canvas to review a few administrative things. Uh, the first link that we've got up here is still the Slack. After that is a YouTube playlist. I moved all of the Alteryx tool videos there. Uh, and I'm working on getting other things there. Uh, hopefully, classes will be streamed to that and then added automatically at the end. Who knows? Uh, the next couple of things are something that, based on the questions I've been getting and some of the comments, I thought was pretty important. I have added a form where you can say, hey, I found a difficult term. I don't know what it means. You say where you found it, and then anything else you have to add and click Submit. Once you've done that, it will wind up on this Google Sheet for responses. The second tab of which is where classmates can fill out definitions. And you guys can review, oh, hey, a bunch of us have the same term, or anything like that. It's a great, great way to earn some of those out-of-class participation points. And it also shows me, huh, a dozen of you are asking about the same thing. I probably need to explain that term. Uh, I'm pretty bad at metacognition on what I don't know when it comes to computers, it would seem. Uh, or knowing what I don't know. Or knowing what I don't know that you don't Whatever. Not important. Uh, the important thing is now you guys have a good way to come up with things that... Uh, words, terms, and other basic things that you're having trouble with, and to share it with the class. Um, next, the Titanic project has the full details that we talked about last time. And there is another link to uh, Titanic novel idea sharing. This is a nice, boring, you know, I'm just going to turn that slightly. You'll put in, hey, I'm on team number whatever, who the three team members are, and then you've got your one to three slides for your novel idea. This is where you will both put your slides in for your team and where you will look to see what other teams have come up with. So we don't have two teams saying, oh, but we both wanted to say this was an important feature. Or, you know, on the flip side, you can say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try that. So whatever. This is here for you guys to use and share. Uh, finally, from this, I found out that the way permissions work on uh, student ID photos that I'm given for the course roster, I am not allowed to reuse them even for academic purposes within the class. I mean, as long as we're using an external cloud, not important. The important thing is I can't manually upload pictures of you guys. And I had intended at the end of the course to say, okay, slideshow, sh slide this is what Lisa looks like. Lisa? Lisa looks like. How often did she help you? Or how helpful was she to your class? Scale of one to five. That's how I was planning on collecting student feedback on each other so I know how much other students are helping you. Because I can't do that quite how I planned, I would, <laughs> would like, I'm telling all of you to upload a picture that clearly identifies you that is not obscene. to be your profile image in Slack. I can then pull that down, and since you uploaded it, doesn't break any rules. So make sure that you get that uploaded. 
Just a profile picture of you. It is in. Oh, you guys cannot see this because there. Okay. You should now see an administrative tab, which I. Sorry, it was turned off. Okay, perfect. I was just going to do it on the same page now. Thank you for pointing out the error I was making. Uh, do we have any other administrative questions before we get started on content? Excellent. Um, so I am now going to close lights for visibility. And I will begin this. Okay, and it did actually show up. That's good too. There we go. So, we are going to talk about model insights to start today. This is going to be going over some ways that we can find out interesting things about features and parts of the algorithms beyond merely looking at what its prediction is. So obviously, predicting things matters most. We have a bunch of predictors. We're trying to figure out a target. All of our business goals at the end of the day are going to boil down to, can we get this target right? However, it is possible while we are doing that, we can learn something else on the side or we can learn something that's useful before our algorithm is perfected and ready to deploy in a useful way. Uh -huh. Let's actually skip to this. Um, and I'm not going to break you guys up into groups for this. But I am going to ask, think back to the diabetes homework assignment. Does anyone remember anything about that? Okay, okay. So basically what the data set is, it's a collection of a whole bunch of records on patients. You are trying to predict if they will be readmitted to the hospital uh, in the context of patients with diabetes. So some people will go in for an emergency the doctor says, oh, hey, I checked your charts. It says diabetes. Cool. I'll make a note of that. Then they will leave. Some of them will come back on another day. Some of them will not. That's what the set's all about predicting. So we know that our target is readmission. Uh, it's a booleam. Are they going to be readmitted? True, false. For training data, we have tons of features. We have their age, their height, their insurance type, uh, who their provider is, how many times they've been to the hospital before, uh, their sex, race, a um, whole bunch of other fields like that. Now let's pretend for a minute that I am in charge of managing a hospital. I want to know this readmission stuff. I sent you on this project. What other things might you be able to learn while you're still playing around with this data? To give you a clue, let's focus in on a categorical field. Uh, smokes, doesn't smoke. It's a nice binary category. Oh, Boolean. Do you guys think that there might be some correlation between readmission and smoking? Yeah. People who smoke might wind up in the hospital more. You might have discovered that while working with your data and training your models. 
maybe your models are still kind of bad or they have problems with target leak or they aren't ready for azine, but telling your hospital administrator, by the way, keep an eye on the smokers. That could be useful. Now, another thing that you might have is, well, I don't know exactly how zip code correlates with readmission, but it seems to be, there seems to be a strong connection there. Uh, I don't know exactly which groups are going to be, oh yeah, this one totally going to get readmitted. I don't know which ones are going to be, no, this one will never come back. But I know that zip code could be really important. It's worth looking into. I'll tell my administrator, maybe you want to look at another, have another team work on trying to parse out what's inside zip code that might tell me more information. And partial differences aren't important because you guys haven't taken enough stats yet. So where are these features coming from? Your source data is totally coming from, it's your same predictors, that's not changing. However, the insight that you're gaining is coming from algorithms that you have run at least part way, or you've run a few iterations of, even if they aren't perfect. When these algorithms are done, some of them will output useful information that you can use like this. Decision trees that we talked about. Uh, when I was explaining how decision trees worked, who remembers how it decides what feature to uh, use? So it's at a node, it wants to go down. How does it decide what to pick there? Um, the vote, right? So the, vote. So, uh, the voting one is random forests. Oh, Sorry. You? No? Change your mind? Okay. True or false? True or false? It's going to, uh, true or false is going to be out. How do they decide what it's looking at true or false on? How does the algorithm decide, I am going to look at whether smoking is true or false here instead of whether eight an apple a day is true or false here? It looks for whatever node will imp improve purity the most. So it goes from being hey, this node up here is like a 60-40 split. I can turn it into a node that's like 80-20 and a node that's like 30-70. That's good. I've got two things that are much closer to perfect. So it'll go and it'll compare each of those and find out what's the thing that will increase my purity the most. That's how a decision tree can give you importance, or that's one way a decision tree can give you feature importance. It knows which features contribute a lot to purity because it's looked at them, a lot of them. In fact, it has looked at all of the features thousands, possibly millions of times. It can just keep a list. These are the good ones. I've never heard of these. I didn't even know it was in the data. Random forests. The one with voting. How might we use voting? So the random forest, in case you guys don't remember, I wasn't super big on it. It's the one where you'll have a lot of different decision trees and then they will vote on which feet, uh, and they will vote on what the prediction should be based on following in their own tree. They get more votes if they're good, less votes if they're bad. How might I be able to use something like that to find features that are important? Exactly right. The trees that get the most votes are the trees that are awesome. We can look at what features are in the trees that are awesome. And then we can look at what features are in trees that have very few votes. Important ones are in all the algorithms that have lots of votes, or most of the algorithms that have lots of votes, because when it randomly selected and screwed up trying to figure out trees, the ones that were good wound up getting a lot of votes at the end. 
And if you can't get a good score without including that as a factor, then that's a pretty darn important feature. I finally broke down. I'm going to talk about regressors. I didn't want to talk about them until we moved past classifiers. But I've just said, oh, we'll talk about it later too many times. That's not fair to you guys. Later today, you will learn that, at least a little bit. Uh, for the next little bit, we're going to be running through data robot. So go ahead and log into data robot. Or open it up, log in. Uh, make sure that your current project is the one selected. Before, we have only looked at the data tab, which is where you put in your initial information, got some characteristics, picked what's categorical, what's ordinal, that sort of thing. The model tab is where it ran a whole bunch of different models. Today is all about the insight tab. This insight tab is kind is probably the biggest feature that separates data robot from some of its free alternatives. These pictures are pretty, they're easy to understand. You can drag things around to tweak them. It's a lot like dashboards if you've taken courses on making sea level executives smile um, by showing them pretty pictures because they're easily entertained, but don't tell them that. So these visualizations matter. Anyway, insight tab. Uh, is anyone not yet at the insight tab? Okay. I am going to move on via slowly. Okay, uh, you do have to have run some models before the insights tab will show up. It'll probably grade out. Uh, yeah, he, he was having a computer, Rob. So. I, I would say hop on with somebody else and follow along there. So after our insights tab, we're going to talk about tree-based variable importance first, simply because it's the easiest one to explain. It's over here. What have we got on this screen? I went. Uh, and pulled up, well, I guess looks like in the top left I've gone into the models tab to do this, but it will be the same information, just a slightly different way. You have your algorithm selected, and it will show you a list of your features off to the side. It goes up to 100%. That means that your best feature will always have 100% and everything else is scaled to be how good is it relative to that feature. So based on the toy data set I threw up for the Titanic project, name is highly predictive. That looks terrifying and scary to me because it shouldn't be super predictive. I'm sorry. If you had someone's name and whether they survived or died, you absolutely can totally figure out if somebody survived or died based on that name. The problem is it's not super predictive because there aren't a lot of people that have the same name. And when they do, they don't necessarily have the same score. It turns out the reason name is at top is because name is broken down into a few features in these algorithms, but we'll talk about that in the text area. So this is name, it goes up to 100%. That's not, there is no non-relative metric here, so it's not like Oh, it's 100%. So that means this explains everything. It's just so it has a point of reference com to compare to other features. So when I go down to fair and look at that, it's going to say, oh, that's like 72, 73% of what name has. So that means it still contributes a fair amount, but it's not quite as good as name. It's better than a lot of other things. And we get some, and it is on a ratio scale, I suppose. So we can get some information out of it. Uh, 
Another very useful tool I have found in this is export up here, which you can pull out. And yes, you can get the pretty picture out of it. Great for reports. Great for the write-ups. But the CSV tab in here can give you a little more detailed information. So instead of guessing what the numbers are, you know, here's what they are in order, and here's what the actual number is. So it was, oh, 73%. That was pretty close to right. Um, but yes, we have 1, 73, 72, 57, and so on. Uh, the zip is just the PNG and the CSV together. But PNG is for the picture. CSV is for the data. This data, you can open up in Excel or Alteryx or anything else. You've played with CSVs a lot before. PNGs, I'm sure any computer that you guys will interact with can use it. The other nifty thing up here is selecting the, uh, creating a new uh, feature list with the top end features. The way that this works is I sit here and I look at my chart. I see, yeah, 100 good. Yeah, 70s are good. I'll, I'll tolerate this 50 over here. Uh, I don't think we have those okay, then I will just not talk about that then. Totally fine. Hey, I had a little bit longer diatribe between tree-based importance from the model tab versus tree-based importance in the insight tab. They show the same information, but are slightly off on details that I didn't want to go over. So sorry that I went down the wrong direction with you guys. Uh, conceptually, they have very similar things. Now I'm going to talk about regressors a little bit, simply because I can't avoid it any longer. A regressor is something that, instead of predicting a category, will predict a continuous value. It will do this by adding multiple different features together and weighting the features based on how much they contribute. So you can think of the probability that, some, that a couple is going to get divorced is equal to minus 0 0.02 times their age when they got married, plus 0 0.4 times uh, if their parents were divorced. Now, I suppose I apply this to an individual instead of a couple. Um, so individual age when married, whether their parents were divorced or not, and then I just have a plus 0 0.25. That's a base level for assuming zeros on the other stuff. So if a zero-year-old whose parents were not divorced, uh, the prediction for a zero-year-old whose parents were not divorced is 0.25. A 20-year-old would be uh, negative 0.4 plus, let's say their parents stayed together, so nothing, plus 0 0.25, 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25 gives us 0.65. This is, in its most basic form, how regressors work. They get a hell of a lot more complicated than this, but this is what it is at its heart. You have your features, they each contribute some amount, and you go from here. Are we cool with this? Do you guys understand this? So what's the 0.25? That is a base rate. So it would be, if everything else was 0, that's what the prediction would be. So uh, it is also known as the residual in a stats class. Uh, it's the leftover bit of the uh, target that you can still predict with no features. So this plus 0.25 would indicate, could indicate that, oh, 
the odds of getting a divorce are slightly more likely than not. Just overall in the population. That's what it would indicate. Okay, so just clarifying, so the weights are on the left side, the minus 0 0.2. 0.02. And then the features are the, okay. Yes, that's exactly right. We've got a target up here. We have the feature or factor or variable, the predictor over here. We have a weight. That's what the feature is multiplied by. And then we have this other little bit that is a, you can think of it as a weight, but the feature is just one. So. It's a predictor where absolutely everyone has a value of 1. So that's why you're just adding the 0.25. It goes to everybody. They'll get the same thing. A reasonable exam question may be, I give you a regression formula. I give you a table. I ask you to give me a score, the probability, the, the number, the target, for a row from that table. Another reasonable exam question that I may ask. I have a whole bunch of these. I ask you what features are most important. What has, I will not say what has the highest weight, but that's what it is. You will also need to realize, if I ask that question, that most significant or most impactful cares about distance from zero or cares about the absolute value. If I found out that uh, membership in the church of we're going to execute anyone who gets divorced has a divorce or has a weight of negative zero or has negative 0 0.98, as its weight, that's a very impactful feature. It is highly predictive of the target, even if it's in a specific direction. And that leads into why we're talking about regressors at all right now. For our tree-based importance, we only talked about one direction. How often did it make the model better when we included it as a feature? When we get into variable effects, we also gain a direction. So we can find out, for the Titanic project, sex equals female is a very strong positive predictor. If you're a female, you are much more likely to survive. If your title is master, you are very likely to survive. It's the proper form of address for a uh, child, a boy child. So you're a type of child, women and children first. Huh, what do you know? Women and girls plus boys. That's exactly what women and children first would be. I got it down to two features, strongly positive. Over on the negative side, if your title is Mr., you're a little bit SOL. That's a pretty highly negative predictor right there. If you're on C deck, you're not doing so hot. If I'm remembering correctly, that's about midway down the ship, a little closer to the bottom. Um, it's above F and steerage, but that's it. You'll see in here that it has const spline high and then a feature name for a few of these. That's just an artifact of how it is, how it uh, bind the data. Some of these algorithms can automatically bind data just as part of how they work. Um, so that's telling you the method that it did for doing that within this algorithm. But the important part is Age is really important. Passenger class is very important. Uh, specifically, 
high passenger class, I'm sorry, medium high passenger class or high age. So being older hurts you. Having a high class number where one is first class, two is second class, three is third class, being two or three isn't good for you. So it's women and children first, but like, yeah, the poor kind of don't count so much. So, uh, when you're at this screen, you do not have a variable effects? It could be just, it could be the data. So, it actually, it, well, I suppose, yes, the trivial answer is it's the data, because it's always the data. But the more specific answer is, when it is running models, some of the models can contribute different kinds of information. You can only get tree-based variable importance from things that are a kind <laughs> of tree, for example. You can only get variable effects from something that has a regressor under the hood. Or an average question, like three or four other things. If you don't have anything of that type, Data Robot just won't show you that option because it has nothing it could show you. Yes. So then how I've used a good modified version of it, yeah. But so how would we get a regressor to show up? So the way that you can do that, let me exit out of this real quick and show you. You know, I was debating whether I should have cut this slide or not. Apparently the answer was uh, no, I should not have. So when you go to your models list, some of your models will have an icon. Let's, fine, I'll go here and then click to there later. Uh, not the artist. So I can't remember the same thing. Um, it is in our models. Leaderboard. No, no, no. So it's definitely leaderboard then. Is it filter? Is that what it says? Come on, page down. Okay, fine, don't page down. Ah, here we go. So there is a little symbol right here. It's a B with an I under, or a beta with an I next to it. Uh, beta is the Greek letter commonly used for weights on these coefficients. These are all of the models that I have that contribute. So if you guys don't have any of those, you can go and manually click add new model and force it to try something that you know is going to, or that you think is going to be useful. So, I believe gradient boosted trees on eh, informative features is fine. I'm in a hurry, so I will drop this. Nah, I'll leave it off. I have to I'll go ahead and click, oh, duplicate the job that's already completed. So apparently that was a good one. The algorithm already found it. That's what I get for thinking I know better. And you should manually put these in or the data robot do that for you? Because we would have to manually do that, but I'm saying like when you ran it. Uh, when I ran it, it grabbed it automatically based on the training data I put in. Okay. Uh, so we, we have to manipulate our data more and then data robot. So if you manipulate your data more, data robot should pick up some of these other things. Uh, alternatively, you should be able to force it under add a new model and then selecting, uh, let's see, uh, regularized logistic regression is something that will give you uh, weights.
Uh, what isn't showing up? Well, I'm saying, like, because our data, data robot's not running these. So is it not? Uh, what step are you? Do you have well, no, I'm a data? Manually right now. I'm just okay. Like, oh, why is it? Like, I'm saying if it's not running automatically, then there, is there a point in having it manually, or will we most likely get a low validation? So I, can, I actually have a great example that Kai used in the book to answer that question. So it turns out that one of the most highly predictive features for whether someone is readmitted to a hospital from the diabetes data set is if they are deceased. Very few people who are deceased get readmitted to the hospital. That's something that data robot struggles a lot with because the reason that they're not readmitted is different from the reason everyone else is not readmitted. So it's trying to train two models at the same time, in a sense, because it says, I'm trying to make a binary classifier, but there's three groups, and I don't know how to handle that. So I'm just going to put this one much more important feature, like one of the best predictors of my data, I don't know what to do with it. That's the kind of place that data robot can screw up and fall into a hole. Uh, and when you're in a situation like that, it absolutely is best to manually run models to see if you can't find a way to force it out of that hole. Or if you can't find a way to tweak your data for the next run so that you'll not be in that hole. Um, and how do you know if you're in that hole or if it's just you threw in garbage and it's saying, I don't know what to do with this? You don't. You can't possibly know. You just have to try. And that's why it's good that we don't actually pay for these workers. Um, you just have to fee that lasts for two years or whatever it is. Because you have to keep trying things until you figure it out. But similarly, I encourage you guys to try some of the algorithms in the add an algorithm. Right now, uh, based on discussions that uh, Kai and I have had with them, there are a number of algorithms that are good or state of the art from research or are very good situationally but bad in other situations that they just don't try right now. Data Robots is capable of doing it. It's just, well, I'm going to throw the best 20 ideas I have at it. Some of these fall on the wayside because they're too new or they're too specific. So going around and trying some of those new models might be a way to find something the Data Robot just isn't trying, even though it could. Yes? If I could answer that question, then I could just give everyone in the class a C and go home because clicking the data robot button would solve, the, would solve it for us. So the answer is there isn't an answer, but that's a good thing. Um, some, I guess, rough intuitions on things you'll want to try. You're going to want to make sure that you've got, um, Okay, you know what? I'll just admit something that's, frankly, I should be more embarrassed of than I am. I look in here on things that I recognize the name of from other times I've run it and it did well. I do things that have a logo I do not recognize because that means it's probably new. I, otherwise, I would have remembered it from the last time I ran it. Um, I tend not to have too many variants of the same thing. So while like uh, Naive Bay's uh, combiner classifier may have multiple different options in here, I assume that the differences in there are going to be more marginal than substantive. That's not always a valid assumption, but it's one I make. And another great resource in doing this would be Google. It's what the pros use. I, mean, I suppose I use Google Scholar, but it's the same thing. Um, and when I see one that has enough fancy sounding words in it, I'll look it up. Or if 
they have the name of an author I recognize, or famous mathematician. It's like if the word Bayes is in it, I'm probably going to run it. Or, I'm sorry, if the word Bayes is in it and I'm lost, I'm going to run it. Um, but it is a great thing to do is you're, hey, what's my novel thing for the Titanic project? Oh, well, I'm going to try three or four of these. I'm going to read about them on Google while it's running in the background. And then I'm going to put some slides together explaining, so this is what a generalized additive model is. Um, that's something that will be of value to your other classmates to know. And it's something that I have not covered in this class. So. I've got to set it up so that left and right are correct on these. So, uh, very good. so the last thing I'm going to cover and things you can learn from a model are partial impacts. When looking at the homework, I saw a lot of people um, were like, ask James what this chapter is all about, or what on earth does this section mean, once we get to around 19.4, I think. The reason for that is Data Robot had an old version that was confusing. It was bad enough they needed a fix. Now they've made a fix, but there isn't a great explanation of what it is yet. So your textbook just is out of date on this. It's one of the drawbacks of the cloud. So I'm going to explain what partial impact is conceptually, and I will not require its use during the class. Or I will not require the use of the tool. You will need to know the concept. So the question of partial impact is, how much does the model change if everything but one feature stays the same? So let's start with a smiley face here. If I change it, the number, if I change the number of eyes that are closed right now, I'll produce these. I've gone from zero eyes closed to one eye closed. How similar do these things look? Uh, they're different. I think there's a different emotion. One's happy, one's a little more. Maybe I know something you don't. Then when I swap to both eyes are closed, well, that's clearly different. Between all of the, those changes, I guess how many eyes are open has some predictive power when everything else is the same. Let's make another comparison. Got a smiley face right here. This guy look happy to everyone? Let's add a hat. Has this emotion changed? Does anyone think that the left one is less happy than the right one? or that there's a secret desire to kill in one of them. No, no, they're two exactly as happy guys. When we change that one feature, has hat from false to true, the model didn't change at all. None of our prediction altered in any meaningful way. That means the partial impact of has hat is very low. Now, Let's look at eyebrow rotation right here. Eyebrow rotation, we have, oh, there's a kind of little earnest guy in the middle. He's just like, oh, I, oh, look at me. I, I'm sorry, I spilled the juice. But you still love me, right? Well, then we've got another guy up here that's a little bit like, you know what, I spilled the juice and I knew that was your laptop. Don't know what a laptop is? But I know you don't like juice on it. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Not allowed to hit me in this state. Um, I'm not going to look that up. And then we've got like this last guy over here. I don't really know what he's feeling. Uh, oh, wait. Now I know what he's into. 
Somebody likes the guy who spilled the juice on accident. Point being, between the three things that we had, eyes open and closed, your eyebrow rotation seems to be pretty important. What emotion was being conveyed when everything else was exactly the same was significant. Top hats, meaningless. Uh, how many eyes are open? Sometimes it mattered, sometimes it didn't. That's another very useful, interesting, powerful uh, part within um, partial impact. It lets us break things down within chunks or groups of a single factor. Strictly speaking, partial impact is only at the factor level, is it impactful or not, but when looking at that, we can see parts of it are, parts of it aren't. Now, I'm going to go through and explain how some of the things in here work. I know it's confusing. I know none of you can run it right now. But you will start by going to your models list. Once you are in your models list, select something. I recommend something that's a blended algorithm. Uh, blended algorithms are algorithms that combine other ones. Talk about that a little. We will talk about that at some point. But blended algorithms are usually going to be ones near the top of your performance. They're good ones to look at for stuff like this. Because they get to look at feature impact from across different models and how they all interplay. But if you go to the model x-ray tab from there, you can click compute model array. And that gives you this information overload disaster. I mean, wonderful product. What we've got here in the plus sign is what the predicted value is based on the model that we have. So for everyone who is on C deck, what, let's run a prediction for everyone who is on C deck. Then let's average together all of those predictions. Next, we have an orange circle that is actual. So instead of taking the predictions from the model and averaging those together, we'll average the truth together. When there is a big gap there, that's a sign that something interesting is going on. Your algorithm is screwing up right there. It is making a predictable error across a large volume of data that fits within this narrow group. So if your algorithm were, or if the test set of your algorithm that you were being evaluated and graded on happened to only have people on CDEC in it, you'd get a bad score because this is where it failed. If you hover over any of the columns, it gives you a little bit of information about it summarized in something or in a table. It will tell you the partial dependence, what the predicted and actual averages are, and the number of rows. The number of rows is also available down here as a little bar chart. And from this, I have found out, oh man, I'm looking at a garbage feature. That happens to be why the error is so high. I just had a lot, very few samples for most of these. But knowing how big each group is can tell you how important it is that there is a failure going on at that type. And it can also tell you that something like a deck, I only had two correct rows on. I'm training on so little data, there's no way it isn't overfit. It's probably just something safe to brush off to the side 
And it doesn't matter what it says for feature important or for partial dependence here, because it's applying to so few rows. Finally, we've got over here, your feature is sorted by impact. So this goes and shows you the, Im, uh, the importance very similarly to what a tree-based importance does. And uh, one last thing, the partial dependence. The most useful that I can give you about this number is you want the difference between the minimum and maximum to be big. Anything else just requires too much math to explain. So over here, the biggest number we've got is 4.25. The smallest number we've got is about 3.6-ish over here. That's not a very wide range. That means this model is probably, I'm sorry, this feature is not giving us much new information in the model. And that corresponds with our 27% importance. So that's what's going on there. Yes, you can click any of these and it will show you the charts for different ones. And within them, you'll have a number of useful options. The most useful one, aside from export to get your data out and to make the pictures, are under more, there is an option to um, hide missing. Frequently, you'll want to hide missing. You can also change what is on a log scale and what it automatically scales. Um, since you don't know that your data is necessarily going to be linear, it's good to try it in different spaces and look at it and say, oh, the gap looks really big. Or, no, nah, it doesn't look that big. Uh, there is also a uh, bins column if you have continuous data, or a bins thing up here if you have continuous data. Um, and, I'm going to end with a little bit about text. This is not hardcore text analysis or anything fancy like that, but merely counting how many times different words appear is really useful. Being able to figure out if text contains, hey, is Mr. in this name, can actually be a pretty good predictor. So. Uh, what the uh, text mining option does from your uh, insights tab is it goes and it gives you something just like your variable effects, positive or negative, except it tells you uh, what feature it is and what the value is on that feature. So the top one up here is name misses. If misses in the name, super positive yes, totes gonna live. If Miss is in the name, not as good as Misses, but you're still doing pretty well. Uh, way down at the bottom, if your name is Mr. John, you're not having a good day. Why did you pick up on Mr. John? Because the algorithm doesn't know how names work. It's just breaking up. Well, there's a bunch of words here. Words are things with spaces between them. It doesn't know that Mr. is a title and uh, John is a proper noun. So it just said, let's take a naive approach. I'll do that. And look, I found something. When you're manually constructing data and pre-processing it in Alteryx, you're probably not going to want to put is named Mr. John as one of your formula tools. Okay, and that is what we have got for today from these. I am going to do something a little different than last class. Uh, you, I mean, aside from like YouTube and all the other stuff. I am going to open the quiz during the last five minutes of class so that everyone doesn't go 
running out when I say I'm done. Because, you know, I want to spend time with you guys. Also, I hope that you learn something and get something out of this class. Uh, but when, the last, when we get to the last five minutes of class, the quiz will open. And until then, play around in all tricks. Look at the Tannic projects. Try out new models. Um, the reading quiz? Yes. The instead of reading quiz. Yes, I'm aware that that means like four of you actually have to stay. I'm hoping you have enough group, you know, team members that there will be peer pressure involved. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that would be the fair answer. I, I don't even know what the fair answer is to that. Everyone else has the benefit of seeing the class, so yeah, sure. I think you have unearthed the flaw in my plan. So, uh, go. You drink, be merry. Do your data. Wave at the people on the YouTubes. Sure, sure. Let me just get uh, so that the internet is watching the class, so someone keeps an eye on you. And I'll go to Okay, so what I would do at this point is abandon ship and go to manage projects, check. value and microphone positive predictive value and negative predictive value are the positive class survived the negative class died <laughs> um, it or at least in a binary classifier that's how it works it's are you going to predict uh, secretly inside these it has one class that's positive that's a one and one class that's negative that's a zero Survived is one, died is zero. So positive is trying to go to that, negative is died. When you get to multi-class classification, so things where you're trying to predict um, either which of three groups does someone belong in or which of three, or of these three labels, which of them apply best to this user, then positive and negative become a little wonkier but the basic idea is still, remember that under the hood it's dummy coded as ones and zeros, where one end of it is going to be positive. So you are though. If I am sex male, that is going to give me minus 0.4 on surviving. If my age is under 15, I'm then going to get a positive 0.8. I wind up positive, but I still had negative components go into it. Okay. Um, it means that some people will be predicted uh, on a scale of 0 to 1, did you survive? You're a negative 12. That's just, let's round to the nearest 0. All right. um, Technically, the solution to that is using logits. Um, it's a probability thing that makes it more expensive each bit you go further away. So, um, if I am twice as likely to die up at the very top, the change is actually not much. Because if I was 98% likely to die, twice as bad as that is 
what, 99%? That's tiny, but it's still doubling. So that's how it's actually fixed. So you can never, you never do wind up with numbers inside the range, but don't worry about that. It'll just get rounded. Just a sec, and I will. Okay. Ah, uh, turn, and what's up? workflow that you're going to have is going to be play around with the training data within Alteryx. Do any fancy nonsense you want to do to it there. Upload that uh, into Data Robot. Data Robot builds a model on the stuff you fiddle around with. Then there'll be something that's awesome sauce within Data Robot. You then take your test data, put it into the same Alteryx workflow that you put your training stuff through, and upload that changed set into Data Robot to have it predict it with your awesome sauce algorithm. So this is generally, uh, the basic idea is you're doing your pre-processing, you're doing your feature engineering, you're doing your handling outliers. Anything that you're doing to the data that you can understand conceptually where you believe you are adding value before the answer is just throw it to the algorithms, you're going to have to do both train and test because you have to do the same thing to all of your data. But Data Robot should have access to the training data to play with and learn on while you are doing your other steps. Don't waste your time on doing, changing the test data if when you try it on the training data, it only made bad models. So if you know that you screwed something up, like maybe you wrote your regular expression wrong, so it's replaced everyone's age with a null. Well, that's not useful to anybody. So all of the models will be bad. 
you don't have to go and run the test data through Alteryx because what's the best you can get? A bad prediction from a bad model. So within this specific example, there is probably very little that you're going to add to data robot aside from some, with age at least, the only thing that I could really imagine you adding is finding out what the age of majority was at the time. It doesn't know that there's a real difference between over 18 and under 18 or over 12, under 12, from a rights perspective, from a responsibility, from a societal perspective. It doesn't know any of that. It just knows, huh, there's a cutoff around here. By manually creating an over 18, under 18, you're saying, hey, this is something that also matters above and beyond what age alone would matter. So you can figure out some stuff looking at age. You'll make some great bins, you'll do other stuff like that, but I know something you don't because you can just math and I have Wikipedia. Some of their models are trained on Wikipedia, but nah. They have not implemented that outwardly facing yet. Oh, they have some cool tech presentations on, like, so we're pulling out your text data. What happens when we, uh, oh, you named this field gender? Oh, what do we know about that already? But generally speaking, most models aren't going to know that. Oh, um, one administrative thing. Uh, in the swap between the two Canvas courses, I some information about the red, large regex homework uh, got a little lost on my end. I have all the files, but I don't have which of you is some 42 character long string of letters and numbers. Um, so a few of you received a mess, an email, should have received an email make sure that you or someone in your group has responded to that. Um, if you did not receive a message or email, do not worry about it. I am not talking to you. I think there's like four of you that I'm actually talking to right now. I, I would need the files again. You know. um, Uh, we're in the last five minutes of class, so people who have a quiz can take that now. It should be open for you. C920.
To be perfectly honest, I don't actually know what the hotspots tool does. I know what the word cloud is, I just think they're overhyped. Like, don't get me wrong, they always get a positive reaction. People love them, but I don't think that, I personally have a grudge against them from my linguistics background, but they're totally fine. Uh, as for hotspots, I honestly just don't know how to interpret it, so not going to present it to you guys. Roughly, it's supposed to, s very roughly, there is something inside of it that says, here's the intersection of two features like how they play with each other. And then we're going to look at how they play with each other. And we're going to use an algorithm that makes things that do that similarly to each other closer and things that are unlike each other far apart. So it's supposed to create areas of, oh, the things in this ball are red and the things in this ball are blue. And there's a lot of space between the red and the blue one. or. There's a whole bunch of blue around here, but there's this one exception for red in here. Uh, that's the kind of stuff hotspots are for. Or so my understanding of it goes. Okay, everybody, that is the end of class. I hope today was useful, or at least gave you things that you could salvage and rip up into your write-ups. Um, have a good one.